I now want to bring in Democratic Congressman from Washington, Adam Smith. He's also the ranking member of the House Armed Services Committee. Congressman, thank you so much for joining me. Really appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. We are going to get to foreign policy news in just a moment. I do have to get your reaction to the special counsel report, of course, that raised concerns about the president's mental fitness. What was your reaction to some of those details, including that the president couldn't recall what years he served as vice president? We should note he forcefully pushed back against that characterization. Well, look, it was gratuitous and insulting without any question. There was no point in including any of that in the report to conclude whether or not you were going to go forward with prosecuting. So it was clearly politically motivated in the way that it was worded. And look at my interactions with the president. He remembers dates and all that just fine. Now, if you're having a deposition conversation in great detail about things that happened over the course of, you know, 10, 12 years, um, you know, a lot of people are going to mess up a date or not get it right. So I think it was clearly politically motivated in the way the special prosecutor worded it. I mean, there's just no other way to interpret it. Um, he can decide whether or not to file charges, but he's not, you know, any sort of doctor who can pass judgment on someone's mental acuity. So I think there was clearly a politically motivated effort in the way that was worded. Uh, it's gratuitous and unnecessary, and it doesn't accurately reflect um, the president's mental capability. Congressman, you know, we've noted that that argument that it was politically motivated sounds a lot like what we've heard from conservatives when they lash out at uh, prosecutors who are either investigated or who've already charged for President Trump. And of course, President Biden was not charged in this case. We want to make that clear. Is there a risk in, in accusing the special counsel of, of inserting politics into his report? Well, facts do matter. OK, you can read the report yourself and you can see the type of language that goes after personal character in a way that's got nothing to do with the charge. And you can reach the conclusion one way or the other, um, you know, and then you can look at the facts in Donald Trump's case where he purposely obstructed justice, refused to turn the documents over, um, you know, tried to hide them in a variety of different ways. They had to get a subpoena to get them back. Um, there are clear differences and distinctions, and people can make their argument going forward. But the key point here is you got to look at President Biden's record. I mean, certainly his record of legislative accomplishments that I heard my colleague Debbie Dingell mentioning earlier on the bipartisan infrastructure bill, on the CHIPS Act, on the um, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, all of the things, that got done because of President Biden's leadership and desire to get legislative solutions to problems we face. He's navigating global crises. I've had conversations with him about the details of Israel and Ukraine and what's going on in the border. And he is on top of all of it. And it's really complicated and really difficult. So look, I mean, you can argue about President Biden's policies. You can certainly have arguments about how he handled these documents. I think mean, that's a legitimate conversation. You know, but to gratuitously take shots at his mental state, well, where does that fit into the investigation? And look, and if people want to say that I'm wrong, I'm being biased, make your argument. Make your case as to why that is a legitimate thing for a prosecutor to say. But... I don't see that argument as having much weight behind it. Before we turn to the Middle East, just very quickly, the report did uh, say that the president willfully held on to these documents, even sharing some of the details with his ghostwriter. The report accuses the president of putting national security at risk. What say you? Did President Biden put national security at risk by holding on to and allegedly even sharing yeah. the contents of some of these documents. Well, 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 that would be the more straightforward, legitimate part of the report that, that the special prosecutor has right to analyze. And look, if what is reported in there is true, if the president said, yes, this is classified. Now, most of what they're talking about are notes mm -hmm. that Joe Biden took, not actually didn't hand over actual documents or show actual documents in the way that President Trump is accused of doing. He was reading off of notes that he took. Yeah. Um, and whether or not those notes contain classified information, that was a judgment the prosecutor made. If they did, as he said, that was wrong. And, mm -hmm. and it should, should not have been done. I can't, can't argue with that. But again, the distinction between that and President Trump, you know, grabbing all of his documents and refusing to turn them back and not cooperating in the investigation. President Biden cooperated at every step of this investigation. He turned the documents over willingly. Uh, so there is a big difference in that regard. I do want to turn to the Israel-Hamas war and get your reaction to what President Biden said at that press availability that he held overnight. Take a listen, get your reaction on the other side. I'm of the view, as you know, that the conduct of the response 
in Gaza, in the Gaza Strip has been um, over the top. There are a lot of innocent people who are starving, a lot of innocent people who are in trouble and dying, and it's got to stop. Congressman, do you agree with that assessment that, that Israel's actions in Gaza are over the top? I agree with the part of the assessment that says that Israel ignoring a future for the Palestinians um, is wrong. It's bad for the security of Israel long term. Yes, there is a military component to this. And this is what I think a lot of people have pushed aside and ignored the position that Israel is in. Hamas is a clear threat, as we all know from the attacks on October 7th, and as we all know from the fact that Hamas has made no bones about the fact that their mission is the complete destruction of Israel. Israel has to deal with that threat. Hamas also hides behind civilians. They put their military operations in hospitals, in mosques, in schools, and it makes it very difficult to get at that military threat. I, I understand that. But another component of this is a non-military component, mm -hmm. and that is to create a future for the Palestinian people so that Hamas doesn't have this power over them. Prime Minister Netanyahu is ignoring that component right now. So has now. he been over the top, do you think, in Gaza? I, I, look, I, I don't... I don't I'm using my words, okay? okay? That, that's President Biden's word. He can say it however he wants to say it. I don't, I don't know exactly what that means, all right? Well, what that would mean to, pres to, to, to you know, President Biden and why he said it. My words are they are not sufficiently concerned about the future of the, Isra of the, the Palestinian people or civilian casualties and humanitarian assistance right now. No question about that. Because if you don't have a future for the Palestinian people, you strengthen Hamas, you strengthen Islamic Jihad, and you undermine any ability to get to a peace agreement with Saudi Arabia and other Arab states who have said they're willing to do that with Israel, which could lead to a much more peaceful, more stable Middle East, but Saudi Arabia will not leave behind the Palestinian people. Something has to be done to build a future for them. And right now, Netanyahu is ignoring that. And I think it's a huge mistake, you know, over the top, whatever you want to call it. I think it is a mistake for Israel's long-term security. I do have to ask you about this aid package. The Senate cleared a procedural hurdle yesterday advancing this foreign aid bill. It would provide aid to Israel, as you know, and Ukraine and Taiwan, but it doesn't have any of the border provisions in it. If it came to the House, will you support that bill? 100%. This is something we should have done months ago. And look, I mean, the Republicans, you know, it, they've said that they don't want to abandon Ukraine. Speaker Johnson says over and over again he doesn't want to abandon Ukraine. And then he said several months ago, but the border has to be attached to it. So, okay, let's go to work. We'll try to figure out the border, even though we haven't been able to do that for 30 years. We figure out, we get a bipartisan agreement, and then the Republicans say, you can't attach the border provisions uh, to the supplemental. Ukraine needs that assistance right now desperately. Putin, as he has made clear, he will push as far as he can push. And if we don't get military aid to Ukraine, the very existence of Ukraine as a sovereign democratic state is in jeopardy. We need to pass that bill. Can it get there in time? Because the original deadline was December, and now here we are in February. We, every day is a cost, okay? In, in time, I mean, Ukraine's not given up. They're going to keep fighting. When it gets there, it's helpful. But every day is, is, is deadly dangerous for the Ukrainian people, every day that this is delayed. And understand, if we can get them that aid, if we can stop Putin's advance, that is what forces Putin to the negotiating table and would ultimately get us a peace agreement and what everybody wants, which is an end to the war. All right. Congressman Adam Smith, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Hope you'll come back soon.